Hello, and welcome to the Nutrition Diva Podcast. I'm your host, Monica Reinagel, and today's topic was requested by Willow. This is Willow. I would love to know more about adaptogens. Are they real? I mean, we've been under a lot of stress in the last year, so anything that can help to reduce stress sounds wonderful. So I'd love to know more about this mythical sounding thing called an adaptogen. I know a lot of us feel like we've been under more stress in the last year than ever before. But even prior to the pandemic, a majority of adults surveyed by the American Psychological Association believed that their levels of day-to-day stress were unhealthy. And you know what? Adaptogens are nothing new either. Although the term adaptogen is relatively new, many of the herbs now considered to be adaptogens have been used for centuries in traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. These include things like ashwagandha, ginseng, rhodiola, and schizandra chinensis. In these ancient medical systems, these herbs were typically thought of as tonics or all-purpose remedies that are good for whatever ails you. Beginning in the 20th century, Natural and alternative medicine practitioners latched on to these herbs as an antidote to the seemingly unprecedented levels of stress that accompany modern life. The term adaptogen was coined around 1940, and it was initially defined as a plant-based medicine that helped the body withstand or overcome the physiological effects of stress, be it psychological, emotional, chemical, or environmental stress. And then just in the last 20 years or so, adaptogens have attracted more attention from researchers who are interested in testing whether these plants really do affect our physiological stress responses, and if so, how exactly they work. In 1998, the FDA proposed the following definition, a new kind of metabolic regulator that is proved to help in environmental adaptation and to prevent external harms. Hans Selye is perhaps the father of our modern ideas about stress, and one of his key insights was that stress is not always or only bad. Getting a promotion, falling in love, or having a child are all examples of highly stressful, but usually positive, situations. The excitement that you feel just before you pop the question to your beloved, and the fear you feel before giving a big presentation at work— are both accompanied by the same stress hormones. When we experience stress or excitement, anything from stage fright to a roller coaster ride to extreme temperatures to emotional duress, our sympathetic nervous system is activated. A rush of adrenaline makes our heart beat faster and increases our alertness. Our blood sugar and blood oxygen levels increase, priming our muscles to spring into action. But it's thought that we spend too much time in this ramped-up state, and that this constant flood of stress, or emergency hormones, eventually damages our organs and increases our disease risk. Adaptogens are theorized to help by buffering the harmful effects of an overexcited sympathetic nervous system. The idea is that these substances don't directly raise or lower the level of specific stress hormones, but rather indirectly support our ability to maintain a balance or homeostasis between the sympathetic nervous system, which ramps up our fight and flight responses when we perceive a threat, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps us chill back out when the threat or the excitement has passed. But are our lives really more stressful than our prehistoric ancestors? I mean, the sources of stress have definitely changed, but is a crushing deadline at work or caring for our children or our parents really more stressful than fending for ourselves in the wild? I'm not so sure, but one advantage that our prehistoric ancestors had over us is that at least they weren't stressed out about their stress levels. And indeed, research has shown that stressful events do more physiological damage when we believe that stress is harmful. But if we're primed to see stress as a positive thing, as a challenge, or as excitement, it does far less damage to our bodies. So it's very possible that by taking a tonic that we believe will protect us against stress, we do in fact experience less harm. But it may be our belief and not the substance that's responsible for this. 
So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence on the effects of adaptogens, and controlled studies are what can help us distinguish biological effects from psychological ones. Twenty years is really not a lot of time in biological or medical research, and although the number of studies has increased dramatically, the science on adaptogens is still in its preliminary stage. Studies on animals and on cells in petri dishes suggest that these plants may indeed have pharmacological effects on a variety of hormonal and cellular systems that are involved in the stress response. The problem is there's a real lack of well-controlled studies on the impact of adaptogens on actual humans experiencing actual stress over time. Do they really change how everyday stress impacts our organs? Do they reduce stress-related symptoms or lower our disease risk? We just don't know yet. There is still a lot to learn about how these plants work in our bodies, what situations they would be best suited for, which dosages and combinations of substances would be most effective, and importantly, whether there are any safety concerns or unwanted side effects. In the meantime, I think there's a lot we can do to mitigate the harmful effects of stress. And here are a few ideas. Number one, start by not stressing about how stressed you are. It's not helping. Instead, remind yourself that stress is just part of life and that we can actually use it to fuel more creative and productive action. Number two, identify and remove optional sources of stress. It's definitely worth it to do an audit of the things in your life that you regularly feel stressed by to see which ones could be reduced, removed, or avoided. Often, the most effective stress management technique we can learn is the ability to say no. Number three, don't compound the problem with coping mechanisms that just create more stress. For example, a lot of people that I work with tell me that stress causes them to overeat and that one of the primary sources of stress in their lives is the fact that they are overweight. Brock Armstrong and I had a much longer conversation about coping mechanisms and how they do and sometimes don't serve us in our podcast, The Change Academy. You can find that wherever you listen to podcasts. And finally, learn how to restore calm because a certain amount of stress is inevitable. So it's also worth learning how to invoke your parasympathetic nervous system to calm your body and your brain. There are many effective techniques, including gentle movement practices like Tai Chi, yoga, meditation, visualization, breathing techniques, chanting, singing, biofeedback, or self-massage. I suggest that you sample them all and then pick one or two that feel most comfortable and effective for you, but then make them a regular part of your routine so that when you need them, they're easier for you to access. Now, if you also decide to use adaptogenic herbs as part of your stress mitigation program, here are some things to keep in mind. Because adaptogens are considered dietary supplements, they're not very tightly regulated. Unlike pharmaceuticals, Dietary supplements are not required to be effective. It is perfectly legal to sell a dietary supplement that has no demonstrable biological effect. In fact, supplements by law must include a disclaimer on the label stating that they are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Now, as long as your marketing doesn't cross the line over into a health or a disease claim, you can say pretty much whatever you want. So, do be skeptical about any claims that aren't backed up by solid, verifiable evidence. Manufacturers and distributors of dietary supplements are legally obliged to make sure that their products are safe and accurately labeled. However, this does not mean that all dietary supplements are safe or accurately labeled, any more than our tax laws mean that no one cheats on their taxes. So only buy dietary supplements from companies and vendors that you trust. 
Thanks to Willow for suggesting today's topic. If you have an idea for a future episode, feel free to send me an email at nutrition at quickanddirtytips.com, or you can call the Nutrition Diva listener line at 443-961-6206, and you might hear your voice featured on the show. The show was written and researched by me, Monica Reinagel, edited by Beata Santora. Our producer is Nathan Sems, and our team at Macmillan Audio also includes Emily Miller, Michelle Margulis, Claire Freeman, and our director, Kathy Doyle. Thanks so much for listening, and remember to eat something good for me. 